All right, so I believe that we are ready to begin. And uh, we've got a wonderful lineup for you and we're gonna kick it all off here. We've got uh, Kelly is our pilot today. Thank you for your love and your service, Kelly. And then we have Heather is doing our prayer today. And I am going to turn it over to Heather to get us started with that prayer. All right, thank you, Jennifer. We'll place our hands on our hearts and take a breath of connection partnering up with our higher Holy Spirit selves. We're so grateful to be joining together today as a community in the name and nature of love. And we offer up any reluctance or resistance to healing, to being lifted by the messages that are spoken today. And what I know is this is a powerful service, a healing service with transformation taking place. I know that Christopher is blessed. He is evoking the beauty and divinity through his musical gifts and bringing forth the light to touch our divinity within and bring forth true joy. I know that Jennifer is blessed and her message is uplifting us all and reminding us of our Christ consciousness in her words, and dissolving all of our blocks to love. Every single participant today is bringing forth healing within us all. And we are joining together to allow this healing to take place and sharing it with everyone everywhere. And it is already done. And so it is. Amen. 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 Beautiful, beautiful prayer, Heather. Thank you so much. All right. Well, we are going to ha definitely have a healing and a blessing with Christopher Spinks here as our musical inspiration. I've known Christopher for years from our collaborations at Agape together, doing Sunday services together. He's a singer and a songwriter who enjoys sharing his original music about love, light, joy, and peace whenever and wherever he can. It is his desire that it helps, his music helps to raise the vibration of the universe, especially during times such as these. And what I know is that your music is so healing, Christopher, I've always, just since the first time I heard you sing, the sound of your voice, the vibration that you carry is definitely inspiring and uplifting. And uh, mm, yeah, I'm just so glad that you're with us again. So thank you for being here. My pleasure. Okay, I'm gonna open with um, <clears throat> kind of like an old traditional song that I, filled with as a child it's just about loving loving god my creator I love you, 
I love you. I love you, Lord, today because you care for me in such a special way. That's why I praise you. I lift you up. I magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled with praise. My heart, my soul, my mind belongs to you because you care for me in everything that I do because I praise you. I will lift you up. I magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled with praise. Thank you, Christopher. You're welcome. Yes, yes, yes. Mm. I remember when I first started taking classes at Agape and people would talk about loving God and it didn't quite make sense to me. Like, God is love. How do you love God? But now I understand. <laughs> yes, I do, I do. Thank you so much. Your, your heart of devotion always shines forth in your sharing. And so it's uh, heart opening, healing music. <clears throat> ah, so grateful. All right. Well, I am so happy to be with you here today on this Super Bowl Sunday. And uh, <laughs> the Sunday before Valentine's Day, uh, I, I've not ever really been a, a football fan. I don't know. It just never, it never was something I was particularly into. My family wasn't really into it. My dad would watch one or two games a year, but um, we just never, you know, it wasn't a thing that I was. Uh, ever drawn to or schooled in. So um, I, I forget about Super Bowl Sunday, though I've been to some fun Super Bowl parties, and I'm for that for sure. <laughs> I, you know, I, one of the things I think about with sports is that sense of competition, and can we have the enjoyment of rooting for a team without being against the other team. And Ernest Holmes said, I, I'd like to be part of a group that's for something and against nothing. And uh, I, I think that's a lot of where I stand is I'm interested in being for love, for beauty, for spirit, but not against people or individuals in this world and I because I'd like to be in a stand for all my brothers and sisters although I might not be a stand for their choices and what they're they're uh, saying and doing 
but in, but still I can be for the spirit that they are. And so moving beyond a sense of competition, uh, it's interesting how there's a phrase that when I first heard it, maybe the first dozen times, I didn't really think, man, I don't think that's true for me. And the phrase is the way you do anything is the way you do everything. And uh, for a, a, quite a while, when I heard that, I would think, I don't think that's true for me, because sometimes I do things very meticulously, and sometimes I do things very haphazardly. So I don't know about that. But I think there is a lot of value to considering uh, how you approach your life is in one, in one area is how you approach your life in every area. There, there's value at least in contemplating that. And some people are highly competitive. Maybe it's a pattern that they brought in with them from a previous incarnation that maybe they were very competitive in a previous lifetime. Maybe uh, they uh, were raised that way. And certainly many people are raised to be highly competitive. I started watching a, a Netflix show uh, on the recommendation of a friend of mine that uh, I think is uh, interesting. I feel like I'm learning a lot by watching it. And it's a show, uh, it's a Korean TV show, and it is about the law. It's about a law firm. And in particular, this uh, lawyer who, this is her first job, and it's called the Extraordinary Attorney Woo, W-O-O, and she is autistic, and she has this very much a savant quality, and also uh, very much has uh, different aspects of autism. She's on the spectrum, as they say, and so she uh, scholastically, academically has always excelled at everything, always the number one, the valedictorian, because she has this um, really uh, extraordinary intelligence. And she, it's not that she just memorizes facts. She really has this deep dive of discernment of being able to look at things from many, many, many different angles and to see all possibilities. And, uh, and she's young, she's just out of law school. And, and so one of her first cases, she's working on it with a colleague at the firm who believes he's in competition with her. So he's trying to make her look bad, stupid. He's withholding information from her in order to um, make himself look good, so he thinks. And this, this whole idea of competition, of course, this is a drama, but the whole idea of competition is one that really gets um, ignited in people. Competition in the family, amongst children and siblings. Uh, it's actually very common for parents to compete for the love, attention, infection for their children, right? Uh, especially if they're divorced, they can get into quite an intense competition. Uh, competition can show up between friends for another friend competition in who's more successful, who's more talented, who makes more money. It's that uh, old ego thought of whoever has the most when they die wins, right? That, that makes life into a basic fundamental competition. And for me, one of the things I really am grateful for about the very nature of spirit is that there can be no competition in God because there's only one. There aren't 
two sides. And there aren't even the appearance of sides in God. So there is no competition. But sometimes we feel like we're in competition. Sometimes people feel really, really jealous. And I think that there are certain threads, we could call them, or belief patterns that we carry that are ours to heal in this lifetime. And so we're working on these patterns and they keep coming up again and again and again. And one of the patterns that comes up again and again uh, that feels like competition is jealousy, right? That people have things that we don't have and it feels unfair. And uh, that thought that life is unfair, things are unfair, I'm being unfairly treated. This is a, a belief that comes up again and again and again. And one of the things that I've witnessed is that the more people are willing to recognize the unity of all life, the less they go to the thought pattern of jealousy or competition or unfairness. It falls away, it dissolves away because of course the, the spiritual teachings are that it is done unto us as we believe. It is done unto us as we believe. So in that, there is no competition. In that, there can be no unfairness. If life is done unto you as you believe, what part of it could be unfair? You get to choose what you believe. So what part of it could be unfair? It's one way to look at it. Now, if we believe that it's unfair, if we're jealous, aren't we in some kind of a victim pattern, believing that life is happening to us instead of through us? Life is happening to us instead of through us. And so then the root cause is not what's happening in the world. Uh, that's not the root cause of our upset. The root cause is the way we're looking at it. Because if we have a fundamental belief that other people get the good stuff, but we don't, that we are unworthy of the good stuff, that life is harder for us than it is for other people. If we're entrenched in that, that's what we're going to see again and again and again. And we can begin to feel that life is unfair and that can make us feel hurt and angry. And what it does, too, is it leads us right into this belief in this pattern that we're not good enough and or that we're being punished. So in the self-love workshop uh, that we were just doing, we were talking about all, some of the ways that we experience feeling punished and doing it to ourselves, or being punished by God. And all of that, of course, correlates to the unconscious guilt. And to me, the experience, the feeling of feeling guilty is profoundly punishing, profoundly punishing. Uh, I, one of the worst feelings I've ever, ever had is a deep sense of guilt. I had it around, I, I think I talked about this a few weeks ago. Uh, I was caring for my friend's dog many, many years ago, like 25 years ago, back in the 90s. And um, he, he, was, he got really, really sick. And I felt guilty uh, around it. And even though I stayed up with him all night, uh, you know, sleeping on the floor, it, in a puddle of his spittle, I still felt guilty that I wasn't able to do more. And it's that guilt that I felt, there's more to the story, it's not worth telling at this time. It just was a searing pain that I felt, this guilt. 
And it took me a um, couple of months to not feel that searing, searing knife-like pain whenever I thought about it. It was just awful. One of the worst things. I can only imagine some of the guilt that some parents might feel based on things that happen with their children. And so the, the, the guilt and the sense of jealousy and the sense of competition, these kinds of egoic patterns can so completely distort how we view ourselves and view the world. And they all feel, to me, even the competition feels like a punishment. It feels like we're in a, a, a gladiator kind of a mentality. You know, the best man win and the other one dies, right? That's that competition can be so unhealthy that if you lose the card game, you feel like you have died. I know when I was a kid, I'd play Monopoly. And if I could see that there was no way for me to win, I would throw the game board up in the air, like in a some kind of movie or something. Uh, but I mean, I just would spontaneously not be able to handle the thought that I would be losing, that someone could do it better than me, that I was failing at it, that I had no hope of winning the game. It would be so devastating to me. I would ruin the game for everybody else. And uh, of course, I would feel ashamed of that, feel so immature, feel so bad. And but many people are in these patterns and they don't even know how they got there and they do not know how to get out. And it can feel like being in a recurring nightmare. It really can feel like that, like in a recurring nightmare. Um, I used to have recurring nightmares and uh, very often those recurring nightmares were about me feeling uh, not good enough, feeling ashamed, feeling like I was just bad, like it was bad, bad, and everybody could see how bad I was. Um, and so this culture of competition can stir all of that up. And it's just on my mind today because of the Super Bowl and there's been chit chat here and there in the news and things people want their team to win. And it's, it's one thing to say, oh, I'd like my team to win. And it's another thing to say, I want the other team to be smashed. I want them to, to be punished. I want them to go down in flames. I, I want this victory that's, that's um, it feels very unhealthy to me. And yet that, that kind of attitude is definitely fomented. It's definitely something that's cultivated in our culture. I, 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 I could be wrong. My perception is, and it may just be from my vantage point, um, but my sense of it is that that is not as strong as it used to be. But it may be because I'm living out in the mountains of Vermont and I'm not in L.A. anymore. Because <laughs> 22 years of L.A. and Laker fever. And, you know, I, I used to joke in uh, whenever that. Um, I don't even know what it's called, but when they're having the playoffs and stuff like that and the Lakers would be involved in those key games, whatever they are called. Um, and people would have these, the Laker flags on their cars and it would just be like, everything was all about the LA Lakers. And I used to say things like, now these Lakers, this is a game played with a ball. Is that, is that what that is? It's some kind of ball game. I'm not sure. 
and it's related to the lakes. Are you playing a ball in a lake? What's happening? I don't know. I just make fun of it because people would be like, you're kidding, right? So, <laughs> um, it's interesting. I, I think I, 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 I will also say that anybody that can enjoy sports and get a lot of delight and fun out of it, watching the games, talking about the games, uh, all of that. I, I think that's wonderful. Anybody can find joy from something, whether it's uh, making the perfect chocolate chip cookie or having the perfect lawn or uh, their sports team. If they can enjoy it, I think that's a wonderful thing, especially if people can come together and enjoy something together. Now, I also lived in Boston for four years and I lived in Rhode Island for eight years. So I have a strong sense of that um, Red Sox fan fandom, you know, and, and I've been to a number of games at Fenway Park when I lived in Boston. And so I have that sense of what, even if the Sox lost, you could still have a fantastic time just going to Fenway Park and being with the fans right? Having the hot dogs and the French fries and all that stuff. You could have a really good time just hanging out regardless of who won. So for instance, all the games I saw, I have no idea who played against the Red Sox and who won or who lost. I have no zero memory of any of that because I really wasn't a fan, but I was enjoying the game. I like games. Games are fun. But when it becomes this hostile competition, then something else is going on. If it's not a friendly thing and it becomes hostile, something else is going on. And to me, it, it is a sense of self-hatred that's coming up for healing, being projected onto the other team, the other people, the other, that it's, uh, whenever there's a sense of a deep hatred, uh, whether it's misogyny or racism, uh, um, political divisiveness, it th this is self hatred projected onto something, and it's coming up for healing. And we generally live in a world where, uh, like I said, this could be fomented, this can be nurtured, it can be accepted and encouraged, and. I think as spiritual students that we have a spiritual obligation to help others to see what this is really about. What is it really about? So even with sports, so I'm, I'm inviting you to think about what situations in your life because it could be in your workplace you know in the workplace there can be intense competition think pepsi and coca-cola right there can be really intense competition in the workplace that between you know you back in the day apple and ibm you could have a really strong sense that these people are competing in the marketplace sometimes to the point where some people um, will have a hatred for the other product, right? And, and this disdain. And they, they're, what they're seeking is they're seeking to relieve their self-hatred by feeling superior and better than. They know more. They have more clarity. They're smarter. They're better. And uh, But of course, it doesn't relieve self-hatred. How could it? One opinion cannot relieve the negative effects of another opinion. It just doesn't work that way. Two opinions don't make a right, right? So what I'm inviting us to do first to just look at where in your life do you see a kind of competition of divisiveness that is uh, unhealthy? You know, because I've heard so many stories about, and we all have, 
TV movies of the week and things where it's about the children's baseball team or the children's soccer team, right? Or the debate team or the spelling bee or things like this that are related to a uh, cheerleader competition, right? Where people would think of uh, Tanya Harding, right? She's attacking the competition. Why? Because she feels so insecure. The idea that somebody would show up as better than her it's so threatening to her identity. She has to, she wants to injure them. She wants to take them out of the game. It's so intense sometimes. So just looking where in your corner of the world are you seeing that kind of competition? Are you seeing it anywhere? And um, I mean, I see it in the political arena because I'm interested in in um, cultural shift and change and a lot of that happens through politics. So I see that. Of course, I also see it in the field of religion. You know, I've had uh, I've had a, a number of times I've had people say, oh, I know this wonderful nonprofit consultant or fundraising consultant or um, marketing consultant or something like that. And I, I, I've told them all about what you're doing with the forgiveness and everything, and they'd love to help you. And then I find out that they went and looked at the website and they saw that it was about A Course in Miracles and they're like, oh, devil, 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 you know, that's like, no, 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 can't have any of that, um, that's not Christian, that's um, some kind of, hmm, blasphemous thing that you're involved in. I can't have anything to do with you. Don't ever call me again. I don't want anything to do with you. I've had Course of Miracles teachers say that to me, that I don't want to have anything to do with you or what you're doing. Why? Because Gary Renard is my friend and they think Gary Renard is a um, charlatan. Yeah, no, I've had... Course in Miracles teachers that you definitely know their names say, don't ever call me or have anything to do with me. I will never be interested in what you are doing. Yeah. And uh, when I first started doing the Living a Course in Miracles classes, I had one of the best known Course in Miracles teachers um, really say that to me. I don't want to have anything to do with you. Don't, don't contact me again. And uh, when I sat with it, I thought, what, what is that about? It seems so un A Course in Miracles to me. What is that about? And what my intuition told me was they feel there's a competition. They feel that there's a limited amount of whatever. And they were there first and it's theirs and you can't have any you can't have mine this is mine it's not yours and I felt that from a number of people and it was interesting because my whole thing has always been let's share let's see what we can do together let me share my platform with this person because they have something to share that is so beneficial. I don't care if nobody's heard of them. I know they have something beneficial. I would like to give them a place to share it because so much is given to me. I can't give away enough. I can't keep up with God. God gives so much. You can't, you can't run out. And so just keep giving, you can't outgive God, but just keep giving it and giving it and sharing it and sharing it. Because that's what we're meant to do, like a fountain. And the truth is, as I conceive of it, you could say, or in just in terms of giving you some examples, 
one of the things that has been very helpful to me is to realize that in our heart chakra, when our heart is, our chakra is open and free as we're meant to be, then it's a constant turning and returning, giving and receiving. Everything we receive, we receive from God. Everything we give, we give back to God because God is all there is. It's just that continuous cycle of giving and receiving, giving and receiving. If we believe in lack, if we start to withhold, if we think there's a uh, competition, if we have these kinds of thought that there's not enough, or that it's unfair. What then happens is we start to restrict the flow. Only the flow is still there, but we're restricting our ability to be in it, to be in the flowing of it, because our beliefs are of lack, limitation, not enough, competition, jealousy, all of this. And so then we experience less and less flow. And that just affirms what we believe. It doesn't affirm that it's true, but it does affirm that we believe it. So the more we believe in lack, the more we will experience lack, no matter how much we have. And again, our experiences don't confirm what's true. They confirm what we think is true. So when we believe in lack and limitation and jealousy and competition and unfairness, I mean, the one thing God, I mean, there are so many things God is that we could describe God as or the universe as, life as. But one thing it is always, and that is fair. It is fair. It is fair. It may not look fair, but it is fair. We may not understand it from where we sit. I don't understand what anything is for, lesson 25, but I can know it's still fair. You know, uh, uh, one of the famous quotes from Martin Luther King Jr., the, the, the moral arc of the universe bends towards justice. It does, it does, it does. And so looking around our corner of the universe, where are we seeing this sense of jealousy or competition playing out? And we can see that it is some kind of self-hatred being projected outwards. And we, we, you and me, we can be the antidote to that because of the way we're looking at it, because of the way we're holding it in our mind, because we could maybe have a conversation with somebody, not knowing what we will say before we say it, but just say, Holy Spirit, send me into the field. Let me be the one who is your messenger. Let me be the messenger of love. Does not have to be words. Does not have to be words. Many times I've been in a public space where some difficulty was happening. People were arguing, maybe quietly in a corner or loudly in a line or something like that. And the inclination is to step away, step back, get out of there. I've learned if I, if I would like to, I can actually get closer, get closer to them so that they are in my field of my loving heart and I can know the truth about them and I can be impactful because I'm willing to see my brothers and my sisters in their perfection, in their wholeness. And it's especially easy if we do not know them. It's especially easy because this is what Jesus is telling us all throughout the course. You are your brother's salvation and they are yours. And that needs to be the focus of our life, is realizing that our loving ourselves 
is our salvation to our brother and ourselves. Because the more we are loving, the more the whole human race is healed. There's nothing more important. So if we can just look at our corner of the world, where is the competition? Where is the jealousy? Where is the thing that's wrong view, stinking thinking? And we can just simply say, I'm interested in seeing what the truth is here. I'm interested in being that loving vibration, answering this particular cry for love with love and then see what spirit guides us to so let's just put our hands on our hearts here and and really think about uh, or just open our mind to where are we being guided to see it correctly to know it correctly to hold it correctly is it friends is it with family is it in the workplace is it in our neighborhood? We don't have to have a conversation with anybody, but it's our job to see it correctly. Maybe it's a place where there's an aggressor who feels entitled to take something from others that doesn't belong to them. Maybe it's somebody that just wants to make somebody else's life miserable because they're jealous, because they're threatened. And let's just keep that place, that space, those folks in our prayers and make it our business to know the truth about them. We will have a healing, they will have a healing. This is a way to be of service to the light that's always available to us. And if we're at a Super Bowl party and, and people are saying mean things, we don't have to talk about it with them or change their mind about it. But in that moment, we can call upon the field of love to offer truth, to offer insight, clarity, to offer the healing. We don't have to just tolerate anything like that in our lives. Never, never do we have to tolerate it. Instead, we can think of ourselves like being an acupuncture needle there in the perfect place at the perfect time, offering the interruption of the pattern and the dynamic healing through the loving heart. So let's rest in the gratitude that we know that we are on a mission from God and we have everything we need within us. And Christopher, there you go. <laughs> Turn it over to you, my friend. Oh, thank you for that word. Thank you, thank you. Your purpose 
us to fulfill. That is why I offer you my service, Lord. Oh, I am grateful for my life. Your love is my reward. So use me. At times I must be still and listen to your will. I hear you whisper in my ear, no need to fear. Oh, Challenges may come my way. Your word I will obey. So use me, Lord. Use me. Use me. For your will. <laughs> thank you yes you are welcome bless you yes 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 oh my gosh you know when we feel like we're in that place of working for god incorporated in service to the light it's just the best feeling it's really the best feeling and that that is the teaching of jesus and uh I, I certainly know that it's true. All right. So we're going to do that thing we do here at the Power of Love Ministry. We're going to go into a breakout so people can share what came up for them. Uh, where are you seeing competition, jealousy, uh, divisiveness in your neck of the woods and holding it? Uh, how do you feel about holding it in the light and really being a, a bringer of light and salvation to your brothers and sisters who are having that experience. Maybe you're the one that feels jealous. Maybe you're the one that feels the competition and the healing can be in your own heart. And then you can share that with the world. So we'll discuss this in our breakouts. And I just ask that in your breakout, if you would please, uh, just please share uh, and in a way that everybody who would like to share gets to share, nobody has to share. So uh, that's how we roll in our breakouts. And Kelly is our pilot here. She's gonna open the breakout rooms. All right. 
So, let's, let's talk about it. So, Rosalind, nice to see you. Oh, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you. I'm so enjoying this service. So many things came up that I would love to speak about. Um, I really want to mention uh, that phrase you used. I don't know who came up with it. Uh, the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. Um, the way I have found that to be so, so helpful is that it's not about details. Like, do you keep uh, your office the same as you take care of something else? Yes, those are not the same. But when people say, oh, when I find the right partner, I'm going to have good boundaries. No, you won't have the better boundaries there than you do now. People say, oh, when I lose 20 pounds, then I'll eat fish or then I'll drink water or then I'll whatever. No, you won't do it then either. So I think it's the dynamics that'll be the same. Like um, if you have unworthiness here, it's going to show up that other place too. Right. Even though you think it won't, you think you left it at home and it won't be in the office, it will. I think right. that's how they used it to, to really be really true. I don't know who started it, but that's how I use it. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to share that. And uh, Christopher, oh, my dear, you really brought it today. Uh, you always bring it, but today you are one with your message. Your passion comes through and uh, your last song so fits with uh, these four spiritual levels that I heard of. And um, I never heard this, the, the complete um, an acronym for it. Jennifer um, has taught me several of these. So she mentioned today when we think of um, the world happening to me, and then you get a little more developed and you see by me, and then you start feeling very connected and you say through me and then you say as me. And when and that fits with your last song so beautifully, right? You know, use me. I am you. You are me. We are one. And Jennifer speaks of the oneness. There are no more. So when, when we know that, then we're then we're in the message. Then we're in the flow, right? Um, so as far as your question, oh, but first I want to mention Heather. Um, I love that you pointed out lifting us and knowing and blessing, and particularly I love that you brought up every single participant because when we're in a room like this and everyone feels included, then we all take the message and we all give the message. You know, we're all part of it. So I love that. Thank you. Yeah. So I wanted to share about Jennifer's question for the breakout room, uh, because as many of you know, I've written a book in the last year or so, and it's been delayed. And that has brought up even more interesting lessons than writing the book. Uh, and um, in this uh, coaching group that I was in for writing the book, um, they teach something that's very effective for, I would call it moderate amounts of jealousy, moderate amounts of unworthiness. I'm not sure it would work with extreme uh, issues of that, but what they have us do, because you can imagine in a book writing group, if there are 50 people and people start publishing and other people are struggling to write, jealousy would easily be rampant in such a group. And she has people out loud or right in the chat say, I am one with that. So if someone gets um, an agent or someone has a published book, 
we we out we out ourselves it's like saying i i was beginning to get jealous and i think just outing yourself is the opposite of what unworthiness does because that's about keeping a secret so back to me uh where where some funny stuff has come up is that I have an illustrator now. It was book was held up because I wanted an illustrator and I had a specific kind of gestural drawing uh, that I would like. And actually I should have thought, you can't actually tell an artist, don't use your style, draw it in another style. Um, that's gonna be harder to find someone that's willing to do that. So mm -hmm. somebody, uh, found me, and it's really important that they found it and the publisher agreed to hire this person as my illustrator, but I don't know him. I don't know how he works. I don't know his work. I did find that he had the potential to illustrate the pictures, but because I don't know him, so I never found that in being Jennifer's student, this kind of thing came up ever because without thinking about it, I vetted her. Before I became the student, I studied who she is. I decided on her. Well, <laughs> I don't know this artist, so he's bringing up more surprises. And I misunderstand him in some of our emails. I think, for example, he's going to throw out the pictures we've already accepted with a new idea. And I'm going, oh my God, you know, we're going to start from zero again. But I have, it's brought up control issues that I have because I don't know him and I don't trust him. Why don't I trust him? If I trust divine timing, then I trust him. So I've welcomed the panic and the misunderstanding now to see, oh, look at that. That was me misperceiving. He isn't doing anything and he's welcoming everything. And it's very odd to be both the coach and the boss because if I don't accept his pictures, they don't, they don't get published. But I've never had to be the boss and the coach. So I've learned so much about myself and mostly it's to go back to live life as God, live life through God, let myself be used as God. And then there's no problems. There are no problems. Trust is there. Divine timing is there. And there aren't even the issues of I am one with that because divine timing means it will or it won't be published, and it will be published in divine timing if it is. So that's my story. Thank you. <laughs> divine timing, always at work, whether we like it or not. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Rosalind. Faith, would you like to share anything? I would love to share. This is the, I have, I wrote a whole bunch of notes today as you were. <laughs> I don't always do that, but they were so brilliant, all these wonderful things. And thank you, Rosalind. Um, one of the things that you said about control, I, I just kind of put the pieces together that when we're um, in the old idea, this culture of competition, that's in service to the ego. Mm -hmm. And feeling that somehow we're in control. If we're competing with someone, I can control that. Like, and how rampant it is in all of our, we've been taught that competition builds resilience, it builds strength, it builds, you know, uh, your personal power and all of that. And it really is, it is a old paradigm that we're, we, I'm letting go. And certainly in the entertainment world and where I come from, there can be that comp competitive spirit, you know, who won the Academy Award, who all of these award shows that we they go through, or how many records did you sell or, you know, all of that. And that becomes this competition that's set up in our mind that if I don't sell a million records, I'm not I'm not worthy or that my art isn't worthy or that it's not being used by God. And so that whole idea that in this kind of shifting from the culture of 
competition to the culture of excellence. Like, how can I be serve in the most in 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 the most excellence way that I can? And that kind of puts it back in in this in the control of spirit. You know, use me as we witness this excellent talent, this beautiful. Um, I, Christopher, I know Christopher very well, and I know how devoted he is to spirit and to letting spirit use him. And then we see this, this devotion to excellence coming through him and writing your book. I know that's true. I'm in the middle of writing my book as well. And, um, and, and working on my record. And one of the things that came comes up for me uh, is, oh, is it other people are doing this too? you know, um, is it worthy? Is it, how does it stack up? How does it stack up against other people's work? Um, and Jennifer, when you said this idea about how people in the, in the community of the course community would be somehow in competition with you or with each other, it feels so out of alignment and, but that's the way the ego shows up, even when we know these things and we know them and we and, you know, and we're letting them go, which is why, which is why being Jennifer's student, I'm going to go back to that, too. And being part of this community is so valuable for me because I continue, continually have the support and the tools to continue to let it go because it's going to it's going to be there. It's going to show up in different ways. You know, when I get my start to get my book out and go through the publishing thing that Rosalind is going through, all of those things I'm sure are going to come up for me to be to look at and to feel and and to and to let go and release and release any of the judgment and do forgiveness work around. But the, here's the good news that I know that it's not it's not the 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 barrage of work that I use like that big big like boulder that I was trying to lift before you know it's it shows up in ways that certainly I know I know how to release now I know how to let spirit show up and that willingness that Jennifer always talks about I know I'm going to be in tears about it because it has brought me through so many times where I'm just willing to show up today I'm just willing to let go of the, of the competition, the scarcity, the anything like that, and just show up and be, be a, a place for spirit to, to flow through. So thank you. Hmm. Hmm. Thank you, Faith. Thank you so much. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the, the inner work that we're doing is extraordinary. It's exceptional. It's, it's profoundly shifting the consciousness of the human race. Christopher, would you like to share anything? Well, okay, yeah, just quickly. Um, um, first of all, just thank you. I'm so grateful to be here. Thank you, Faith, for the invitation. I'm Reverend Jennifer, Ms. Rosalind, everything you guys say, just, 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 just nails it for me. Um, yeah, I mean, wow. That political piece that when you spoke on that, that's one of the things that really has had me over the last, I don't know, since 2017, just in a really not good place because I've always come from a place in space of love and that's all I've ever known. I did not know how much evil was out into the world, out in the world until it was revealed to me by someone else. And just seeing, I just, and it sounds kind of crazy to find out in my 50s, that everybody's not seeking love and peace and light and joy. Because I really, honest to God, I thought that that was a goal of everyone. And mm -hmm. I did not know about all that hatred and jealousy and all the things you spoke of. And you just helped me to understand the reasons why. And it, 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 yeah, you just helped me put so many things together in that, you know, in regards to, especially the things that, 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 that the, the um, injustices that happened to people of color. And yeah. I, yeah, you really, Help me put a, you know, just a whole different spin on the hows and the whens and the why. And, mm -hmm. and you challenged me again to, you know, be of service to the light. You mentioned service to the light. I wrote that down. I got, let me be the messenger of love, you know, and 
I just have to be more of that to combat myself and the other you know people in the world who, who are looking to be loved in life. So I just just thank you. Thank you for letting me be a part. I'm so grateful to be here. And um, yeah, that's all I have to say. You know, just keep doing what you're doing and being of service. And I appreciate it. And I appreciate you. Mm. Well, it's mutual, mutual appreciation day here. <laughs> Heather, we don't have much time left. Would you like to share anything? You're good? <laughs> Thanks. Um, no, I just wanted to share that um, this is exactly what I needed to hear today. You know, my daughter um, does competitive cheer and I've definitely been trying to hold that space and teach her, you know, it's about the love and the joy and the connection. And um, it's been beautiful because parents have actually been stopping me when I take her to practice and telling me how uplifting my daughter is to the other girls. And yeah, when we went away to a competition last weekend, the parents were just sharing how, you know, um, it, they're grateful to have me around. We all help the girls get ready together. And I've been like a calming presence on them, they said. So um, it's beautiful to see, you know, this at work, but um, you know, my daughter, did have a cry for love last night with uh, some competition she feels I think with her semi step siblings and um yeah had had some tears last night and some prayers out under the stars and so your message today just I uh, was deeply healing for me and I know for my daughter as well so thank you oh how perfect how wonderful thank you Heather yes uh, somehow I'm reminded, um, Heather's talking about her daughter who participates in competitive uh, cheer, cheerleading. And um, I'm just going back to my, okay. Uh, and I feel it's so beautiful the way children demonstrate what they are being taught. And I'll give you two examples. I think Christopher knows Liz and Paul Racy. I know Faith does, um, my very good friends and um, uh, longtime prayer partners, 25 years. And um, so I've known Britta since she was uh, a baby and um, their daughter. And uh, I remember when she was about three years old, Liz told me or Paul told me that they were driving in the car. Britta was in the back seat in her car seat and Liz and Paul were arguing. And Britta, three years old, she interrupted them and she said, guys, guys, can we all just think about God? Right? Her parents are arguing. She interrupts them. And so, of course, Liz and Paul look at each other like, yeah, Britta, we can just think about God. Good idea, you know. And then another Britta story was when she was maybe five years old, six years old, something like that. I think she was either in kindergarten or first grade. And um, Paul told me the story that that uh, after school, uh, when he, he was picking Britta up, from school, the teacher called him over and said, I wanna tell you what happened with Britta today. And Paul was a little like, okay, you know? <laughs> and she said, um, uh, one of the boys, let's just say his name is Johnny. Uh, Johnny was getting into fights on the playground and people were getting, kids were getting upset and there was a big brouhaha. And she said, and I noticed that Britta went over and sat down at a picnic table and put her head in her hands. And uh, I was concerned about her. So once I got everything straightened out, I went over and I said, Britta, Britta, are you okay? And she said to me, yeah, I'm just praying that Johnny remembers who he really is. 
So, you know, this is just a child, right? So children are always watching what we do. And so she learned that from her parents. You know, we don't always live what we know, but when we can work as a group, as a family, as a team, and the thing is, is we can work as a group and a family, as a team with people we've never met before. Because we are a group and a family and a team, whether we've met each other before or not. And so that requires us, we have to be willing to love ourselves enough that we can extend it to our brothers and sisters. And we love our brothers and sisters enough that we can fully extend it to ourselves. So, and this is the, this is the great joy of life, that we can have love without conditions, without illusions, without limitations. And I, I, I feel it's so helpful to just think about where can I bring more love to the world? Not, not by necessarily saying anything. We don't always have to say something. We can just know it and be it. So yeah, beautiful. All right, we're gonna make a couple of quick announcements here. And then we're gonna have another song from Christopher and another prayer from Heather, and then we're out of here. So uh, announcements, Masterful Living registration has been reopened just for a number of days and tomorrow is the last day for uh, joining uh, Masterful Living for the very first time. And uh, trying to think, do I have another announcement? I think it's really, I'd like to announce that uh, I feel really grateful for the team that makes Sundays with Spirit possible, including Faith and, and Rosalind and GJ and Kelly and uh, Heather, our, our prayer practitioner today, and, and so many people that make it possible for us to offer these services online uh, in April to be three years that we have been doing these Sunday services. And so your donations help us to give a tithe to the musicians and the speakers. And of course, they help us to pay the salaries of the staff so that we can offer more and more things for free. So thank you for your contributions and your support. It really does make a difference. People have told me that they came to Sundays with Spirit for the very first time they didn't want to turn on their camera, they didn't want to share, but they had never experienced such a welcome that they had to turn on their camera in the breakout and they had to share. And that to me is just the most wonderful thing that we are creating together. We are creating that together. So we are being the love of God and people are noticing it and they're comforted by it. So thank you for your sharing that makes it possible. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Christopher. And please share if you have any announcements, Christopher, let people know how they can get your music. Yeah, no announcements today. No announcements. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. I give up, I give in. I surrender to love. I take off my gloves, throw up my hands. I surrender to love. I give up, I give in. I surrender to love. I take off my gloves, throw up my hands. I surrender to love. I love to smile at everyone I see. Some reflect the love back at me. If they won't, I don't take it personally. I don't regret it. I don't even sweat it. No, cause the love and light that's inside of me sustains the joy and peace that sets me free. 
helps me to be who I have come here to be. So I surrender. Won't you surrender to set it aside. I surrender to love. I look from within, no longer above. I surrender to love. I love the smile at everyone I see. Some reflect the love back at me. If they won't, I don't take it personally. I don't regret it. I don't even sweat it. No. Cause the love and light that's inside of me sustains the joy and peace that sets me free. Helps me to be who I have come here to be. So I surrender. I'm grateful I surrender to you. Surrender to God, surrender to joy, surrender to peace. I surrender to love, to love. Yay. <laughs> Thank you, Christopher. Thank you so much. You're very so welcome. Here. Yes, so beautiful. Such an inspiration. All right, Heather, I'm turning it over. Will you say a prayer and take us home? All right. We place our hands on our heart. We're so grateful and thankful for this loving community and for this opportunity to join together in the name, the nature of love. We've healed our false beliefs in lack, attack, separation, limitation, and we're grateful and thankful to acknowledge the deep healing that has occurred. So grateful and thankful for everyone who has shared their talents and their words to bring about the loving transformation that occurred during this service. We know that this deep healing has occurred and it is within us now and forever. We've healed these false beliefs deep to their root causes and eliminated it from the consciousness of ourselves and our brothers and our sisters. We are blessed. Our lives are blessed, our families. We're sharing this healing with all of our brothers and sisters all over the world because we are all one. We know that it has already been done. So it is. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. Beautiful prayer, Heather. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining. God bless you. Happy Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs>